what was the biggest learning that you had from the yum yum tree when we did yum yum cha the idea was to take best of yum yum tree and to discard the worst as many people walk through the door you need to kind of fill up the rest right we figured that on certain days when we were empty we were very very empty and on the days that we were full we were so full that there was a line outside uh we realized that when you were giving alcohol to people you would have to uh, couple it with offers uh we had a lot of discounts we had a lot of deals so when we opened yum yum cha we did the opposite so it became small versus big it became no offers or no discounts versus lot of discounts no alcohol versus alcohol dependence um and then what we did was a very unique thing where we took the top 10 dishes that yum yum tree sold and we banned it I took the stairs. I never took the I took the stairs in 2015. <laughs> I still I still remember that day when I took the stairs. <laughs> See from someone like me it's uh, you know look at the khana kaisa hai. To main kehta hu ye saboot dekho. So I need proof that the food is good. Food must be all around mm. you all the time. Yeah yeah. Completely. Food is uh, everywhere. It's by my bedside. It's on my uh computer table but yeah but uh in general we i've grown up you know with food as a centerpiece of my existence so whether we travel whether we you know are eating at home it's never just eat it has to be what we are eating how we are eating it and uh, it's always been my personal passion which is why i'm in this business nowadays my own uh, struggle is to avoid food as much as i can but whenever i have food in front of the table like like in front of me on the table i have to eat it as you saw as i saw and in fact i must say that when we i came over once uh, you know uh, to your place and uh, you ordered some food from outside and i i saw you eating the maximum i i don't i don't think anybody else you were going at that dal and probably seven eight rotis i must have seen you pick up yeah uh, so i've seen you do that but you were a fat kid chubby kid yeah your fat jeans at least never fat but yeah jolly jeans kehte hain usse nowadays i do one or two meals a day max right otherwise there is no stopping me yeah so when did you start the business when did you get into this business so i got into this business in 2008 officially uh, we started building our first restaurant 2007 it's a restaurant called yum yum tree in uh, friends colony it was a fairly large restaurant i was a typical spoiled kid coming back from america uh, so i had to open something larger than life uh but i have been cooking since i was 8 years old that is something that you know has always intrigued me and excited me watching food shows uh but our first restaurant uh, was a, was a very unique uh prospect in which uh, you know i mean india was very used to only doing chinese restaurants for example right there was an off japanese restaurant there was an off thai restaurant but this concept of pan asian didn't exist in india and in fact to be honest didn't really exist in the world either and the idea was to kind of create a product which in our mind we were confused whether such a large chinese only restaurant would work so we thought that we need to have options and the ability uh, the restaurant was called yummy yum tree and it was also the name was also kept very fluid uh because we may have wanted to change our cuisine later on so for example sushi was never uh, the product that we started with it took us about 6 months to discover that we want to get into sushi so uh that's when we kind of started our journey right and we 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 took that for uh forward for 8 years total closed down in 2016 two years after we started yum yum chain we realized that a smaller format is is essentially our zone you know everybody has a zone of what they like to do and uh, we started catering in uh, december 2010 uh which which had become a fairly significant business by the time we shut yum yum tree at that time but Yum Yum Tree, I felt, gave us our identity. It gave us uh, uh, s- some kind of uh, recognition in terms of uh, trust and loyalty in the city. Uh, so many people in the organ in Zomato, for example, uh, Mayur, I met at Yum Yum Tree. Uh, while we were doing Yum Yum Tree, I met you and Pankaj once many years ago, which you may not even recall. Uh, actually, it wasn't even Zomato then; it was Foodie Bay. 
at that time we were just trying to get your menu back then and you didn't i we weren't giving you a menu yeah finally finally we gave it to you meetings or some <laughs> long chase so the so the meeting happened because we refused to give you a menus and yet the menu somehow appeared online because somebody had taken photographs and kind of put them there and i think that meeting was to to kind of officially take them mm-hmm. and to 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 kind of do that yeah i remember that yeah that was back in 2009 or 10 i guess yeah yeah yeah, yeah it was 9 mm-hmm. and how has the journey been like what was the m- biggest learning that you had from the from let's say yum yum tree so when we did yum yum cha the idea was to take the best of yum yum tree and to discard the worst so it was a very large restaurant it was 8000 square feet yum yum cha our first location was 800 so uh, yum yum tree was a very large restaurant it had a lot of uh, dependence on alcohol we used to do sunday brunches and we used to do uh, cocktails how many seats how many tables uh, 200 seats okay. uh, 8000 square feet three distinct areas there was a bar there was a fine dine and there was a casual area uh, so we discovered many things we discovered that you don't need to be large because a restaurant is one door and as many people walk through the door uh, you need to kind of fill up a restaurant right uh, we we figured that on certain days when we were empty we were very very empty and on the days that we were full we were so full that there was a line outside so we realized that we need to have a line outside uh we realized that when you were giving alcohol to people you would have to uh, couple it with offers uh we had a lot of discounts we had a lot of deals so when we opened yum yum cha we did the opposite so it became small versus big it became no offers or no discounts versus lot of discounts no alcohol versus alcohol dependence um and then what we did was a very unique thing where we took the top 10 dishes that yamem tree sold and we banned it okay so we i have this uh kind of uh, thing that i have to cut off or suppress uh in natural tendency of something to sell for creativity to bl- blossom right so the highest selling dishes used to be hakka noodles um used to be you know honey chili potatoes there was a fiery hunan chicken we used to sell and hakka noodles actually was the casualty right and everybody told me how do you start a restaurant without hakka noodles i mean you, you can't i mean it was like the number one seller and how do you do no hakka noodles so it kind of created this idea of stone pots which we did and which became extremely popular at at, at yum yum cha which no hakka noodles were allowed uh, no chicken and egg so we don't have egg in any of our noodles but we were able to create a concept that kind of just blew up completely so i feel that those decisions of curtailing ourselves and to kind of uh, put uh, a restriction to kind of induce creativity so to speak uh, became very uh, nice and we kind of followed that rule for a very long time all our restaurants have been small uh, even when we opened tablespoon and pot pot we decided to stick to small restaurants we like the fact that there is waiting outside our restaurants we like the fact that there are no reservations we don't know reservations in any of our restaurants and we've kind of stuck to that zone and that rule um, many people kind of say you know anybody will come to your restaurant and they'll completely screw up your concept they'll come to your restaurant and say we have to have hakka noodles we have to have um, you know pizza you know i'm sure in a chinese restaurant why do you or an asian restaurant why do you want pizza right the dal nahi hai ek dal roti mangwa lo and people kind of modify the concept so even when we were very large and we had empty seats on weekday nights uh, we we decided not to go into the the you know buckle so to speak uh, you know stick to the concept stick to what we were doing um and 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 it kind of worked so this is pretty much uh, opposite to what most other people do do you agree yes right. and we are known as and i i think zomato team would also agree that we are difficult people in general and uh, you know when something uh, gets set in my head to say that i have to do things in a certain way it i pretty much follow that you know so much so that i am surprisingly not a person who will go to many restaurants in my own city uh, because i don't care so much about what the competition is doing i like to create uh what i'm doing and if i have to compare and if i have to get inspiration then i'd rather get global inspiration rather than local inspiration right so a lot of people would kind of follow uh you know uh 
we like to be leaders you know we like to be people who have created something completely unique and whether it is our restaurants and whether it is our uh, you know products that we do within our restaurants our cuisine our way we train people the what salaries we give our our team members you know we we actually do give extremely high salaries for the level of people that that exist because at the end of the day you can you can do what you want but we live in an expensive city and people need to survive and a happy you know person is someone who is paid well um so so we got a lot of flack from a lot of people for doing certain things why are you spoiling the market why are you paying a certain amount of money more so we said we'd rather have more number of uh, middle level employees rather than pay one or two people extremely high salaries and uh, uh, so many rules that we followed we kind of did it in our own way so yes so we did operate against the grain and to a certain extent we still operate against the grain so you have been able to survive against many odds yes while doing your thing yes. and still running a very large successful business in so many ways right yes now the mortality rate the five year mortality rate of the restaurant industry comes down to 90ish percent right right and you lie on the other end of the 10 which is sure. which is still left sure sure what do you think people can do should do to reduce the mortality rate from 90 to let's say 80 even that would be a huge win so i think what a lot of people forget is that rest the restaurant industry like any other business is is hard work right it's not just glamorous a lot of people think that it's it's glamorous i think a lot of people forget that you need to have a certain amount of education and talent to be able to do any any work you want to become a dj you need to have a talent for it you want to uh, you know uh, be in a factory and manufacture you need talent for it right a lot of people will not check their talents um you know they won't check the skill set that they have before they actually go at is this business for me or not the second thing and fortunately or unfortunately in india um, we are still not like the western world where kids once they are 18 are on their own a lot of parents kind of support their kids till they are 25 so we see a lot of people who are operating not with their own money uh, you know uh, but maybe with their parents money and money that is free to them so the value for that money doesn't exist right and me included right so we when we opened our first restaurant i wanted to open one of the largest restaurants in the city uh, why because i came back i wanted to be well known i wanted to have all this um and a lot of people want to do the same thing they want to open a large restaurant they are not experimenting with a cloud kitchen for example they're not experimenting with a smaller sized restaurant they're not experimenting with using less capital so i tell people very often who want to get into the restaurant business your first venture will fail period okay it'll be a very rare occasion in which you'll succeed so cap it at let's say 10 lakhs okay why are you trying to do 2 or 3 crore rupee uh, as an investment do it at 10 lakhs let it fail do the next one at 25 lakhs let that fail you know and then by the time you are ready to spend a crore or 2 crores on opening a new restaurant you would have learned some things from the market and i think that that if they reduce their capex and if they just check their talents or partner with people who have talents if that's the it's as simple as that right you can't just say i want to become like the painter that will sell you know paintings for 1 crore rupees overnight you you have to have the talent to paint you have to get the market used to your product uh, and i think uh, that is the best way just like fair any enough. industry fair enough and until date like till date you have a lot of friends in the industry as well yeah what do you think are the biggest mistakes people are still making while not i mean the the market could be going somewhere but people are pushing towards something else where do you see uh, effort versus reality gap so i think one of the biggest things that i feel and i by the way I have a lot of enemies also not just friends <laughs> in the business as you know so uh I think one of the biggest things that people do and I think the biggest mistake in my opinion in India and and we'll talk about a little bit of a scale right we I don't want to talk about uh, uh, the the mistakes made by people who may be starting out because mm-hmm. Absolutely. everybody makes kind of that scale is I think a lot of people say that if I have a successful restaurant in Bombay or Bangalore or Delhi they want to go national and they want to go national very very quickly they also want to open 
three or four or five restaurants before they see the first one being successful because they have the plan in front. What is the point of having that? And I think nobody realizes that if you open in another city, your own personal life gets affected. Your team members get, get divided and diluted. Your talent needs to get retrained in a different culture completely. The palette of the other city might be completely different. Now, if you look at medium-sized restaurant chains anywhere in the world, I'm talking about three to 10 restaurant type of sizes. The New York restaurant tour would pretty much be New York. A London guy would be in London. A Philadelphia person would be there. A Singapore person would be in. I don't see a Singapore person saying that I want to now open one in London. Maybe they do it after 20 years or 25 years or after they have a certain size and a certain scale. But your own city has so much potential wherever you are. You could be in a smaller town as well, but be the biggest in your town. Um, I think that for me personally would be to own the city rather than to try and go left and right and try and, you know, kind of figure it out. And the second thing is know the product is successful before you open five locations, uh, you know, open one location, let it be successful. Do two years or three years of, of sticking to that. Uh, we stuck to one cuisine and uh, for, I think, uh, from 2008 to 2018, we were in one cuisine. We were not doing multiple cuisines. We did have a catering brand, but we would outsource much of our our uh, unknown cuisines, the you know, Indian or European, etc. We would take help from other people. But Asian was our cuisine for 10 years. And that's what we knew. That's what we stuck to. And how did you build a team around you to execute this from the start to, let's say, now? Because there's no... India does, does have a dearth of talent right. in this sector. Work very differently in my company. I like to do things that I like to do. And I don't do anything that I don't like to do. So I like to cook. I like to be involved with the food. I like uh, the procurement as a result of the food. And I like the creative angle. I like making artwork. That's a hidden hobby. A lot of people don't know that actually most of our brands I've created myself and I don't do anything else, right? So I leave the other parts, the HR, the legal, the admin, the finance to other people and let them kind of handle that. I think if you hire somebody and trust them to kind of build the team and look at the overall result, like I want to see that the food is good. If I have a chef I trust, I let them uh, hire other people. And of course, relatives, there is nepotism. Relatives get hired. People from the same community kind of get hired. Uh, there are people who are favored more than others. But by the end of it, you get a team that is more comfortable with each other. You yourself are completely free to do your core competency or your thing that you enjoy in the company. I have another very simple rule which says that if I'm receiving a phone call, somebody is not doing their job. So I try and reduce the amount of incoming calls I get overall uh, and let people make the mistakes and make the decisions rather than, you know, I, I always say the, a bad decision is better than no decision. You know, so I let, let the team handle it. And uh, I think they've done an amazing job. I, 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 you know, I think it's all our team that has, that has helped us. And did you have to train and coach a lot of people hands on or? I did a lot of hands on screaming. I think that was that was there for sure. Uh, I think I myself was hands on, right? So I, I, you know, my wife to a large extent. When we opened Yum Yum Chai, I still remember for the first few months, uh, we were taken aback because we were more uh, crowded than we had expected, and we had to stand there ourselves. And whether it was clearing a plate, whether it was taking an order, whether it was standing at the kitchen for three hours at a stretch, just making sure that the orders would come out on time. Uh, that is something that. And that was the training. And I, I feel that if you are trying to lead somebody, you should know the skill that they possess or you want, expect them to possess, right? So if I am taking care of the kitchen, I should know how to cook all the dishes. And I, I do know how to cook every single dish. We have a repertoire of, let's say, 2,500 dishes across our organizations. And I could make each one of them. And I just like to know. I like to learn. Um, and I think just... Telling people that they should know what they are trying to teach is half the battle one. So learning is training. I think, I don't know if that makes sense, but in our organization, at least. So, yeah, so uh, you are saying that your mode of coaching people is more that you would do 
the thing that is required to be done and people can watch and learn yes or tell a manager ke pehle tum waiter bano become a waiter only then only then can you teach the waiter what to do you know i want to see you hold a tray i don't think you can even hold a tray maybe you will drop everything so how can you scream at somebody for dropping something if you don't know how to hold the tray yourself you know at a certain level once an organization is in motion uh, the only way to kind of do something uh, to train is on the job right we don't have training programs where we have three months of training uh, because there's a lot of attrition by the time you train someone you'll figure out the person has already quit you know so how do you how do you kind of surpass that so you throw someone in the middle of work and you let them learn but the person teaching is is basically the person who should know how to do it and uh, slowly leave the reins so you start doing it and then you kind of build forward and forward and forward so even if you've had 10 years of experience at another organization as a chef you've been doing everything uh, you may have to make the dough or you may have to make the rice and you'll question why am i you know what have i done for 10 years that i have to stand here and make rice well you're making rice in our organization you're figuring out how many wash cycles we have in our rice you're figuring out what our recipes are so of course you got to do it and and take a look at it so i think that's the best way in my opinion uh, to train somebody tell me a couple of times where you have been wrong and wrong in a big way and when you look back oh shit i should have done better oh yummy yeah, i was wrong that a big restaurant is what is required a lot of people feel that the bigger the restaurant is the more number of people kind of come in uh, that was a very very big and very expensive learning to have we realized that you can turn tables fast and have the same restaurant uh yield more people even if it's a small restaurant just to give you a perspective if yummy yum tree was 200 seats and we would do 200 people a day there a yummy yum cha at 800 square feet one tenth the size with 40 seats would do 400 people a day right so it is possible so that was a very 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 uh, kind of strong learning um another learning was uh, i think we stayed away from delivery for a very long time i think that definitely was a was 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 a was a mistake uh, to figure out that our food can't travel right and uh, uh, we learned that in covid that when we did start and then when we did uh, the, the world was very very uh, happy to accept the product and people do realize that the food at home can never be the same as freshly cooked in front of you but they are expecting it you know you need to be a 9 on 10 i think consistently be a 9 on 10 rather than try and strive to be a 10 on 10 all the time uh, so i think uh, you know ignoring delivery for so many years is 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 something that is incorrect and the third mistake is yet to come i think that mistake has been uh, maybe i learned that that mistake was to stick to delhi and not be you know the the, the thing that i just mentioned that not to go all over the country i'm uh, you know fairly scared of failure Uh, because our first failure was an expensive failure so uh, you know you you kind of are fearful so i think we need to bring back the fear of failure uh, or remove the fear of failure and let 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 some failures happen now going forward uh, to be able to create and do more things we've not actually had a failure in a very 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 long time and in fact when covid hit i was i almost had anxiety for a few years where i thought that we've been doing so well and they teach you when you're getting into business if you're from a business family that there are up cycles and down cycles so i was always like where is the down cycle you know it's always been the up cycle and we were very fortunate and lucky to have a lot of up cycles post the first 5 years of a lot of down cycles we started having a lot of up cycles and it was consistently up cycles so when covid hit and work stopped it was almost like induced failure that you had to stop uh you seeing your business go down for the first time and that was a catalyst we almost tripled in covid that was a catalyst so what all did you change in terms of your own mindset and in terms of the operations in a business from being a fine dining place to a delivery friendly yeah so restaurant. so i think the biggest learning from covid was that you can't be alone i think i was very much a micromanager pre covid right i was Uh, whether it was restaurants whether it was delivery whether it was catering i would basically take decisions myself i would like to be there everywhere i was one of those people who refused to travel in covid my first flight was in october 21 uh, so a year and a half after covid is when i actually took my first flight 
and uh, I realized if I'm not willing to do that, then I need to give away some of my decision making. I can't physically be somewhere. I need to. We need to start a delivery kitchen, for example, at a location which I've not seen. Right. So somebody has to find it. Somebody has to build it, and somebody has to kind of start it. Right. Uh, so I think that was a very very big operational change where we gave freedom to operate in decision making to a lot of people and realized that when we do have so many people you know few, at that point we had 450 people in the organization we we have you know 450 minds and brains to leverage and to uh, look at now we have 1200 people in the organization and we've uh, have that much more talent and ability to to be able to kind of do that the second thing that happened was that uh, uh, Yamim Cha, for example, which became our most successful brand and still till date is, uh, we, we refuse to deliver from that uh, without realizing that every brand has a pull. And uh, we created a brand called Noshi just to do delivery. Brand trust and realizing that brands have trust and to focus on building brands is something that we, that we learned as well. So when we built our new brands as well, I think we went very heavily on focusing on creating the brand. So for the first time in many years where I used to design my own brands, we we hired an agency, for example, to create a brand called Tablespoon. Um, and that was a very big thing for me to give away creative uh, freedom to someone else or to listen to someone rather than dictate of how the restaurant would look, what the brand would look like. So both the architect and the would completely, it was not in my control. The food was still in my control, but to give away certain aspects that I would micromanage and I would want to give away. So I think that was the biggest change in the overall way of operating in us. And and how much time did it take for you to change the menu or the recipes to make the food travel? I don't think we changed the recipes as much as we changed what or we looked at what items could be delivered and could not be delivered. And eventually, once we got the hang of what can be done and cannot be done, we started changing it. And um, it was also like, for example, we had dim sum with sauces. We started giving the sauces on the side and putting a little label on top saying pour me because they had to be poured on top. We realized it would get very soggy by the time it would get delivered. Um, So we started figuring out a semi DIY approach to certain products rather than change the product completely. You know, so mix me, pour me, uh, you know, instructions on how to eat, how to mix. In Pot Pot, we created, you know, we wanted to do chart. Now, chart is something you eat on the street. What a lot of people don't realize is that you have to eat it immediately. Crispiness goes away. Uh, and the whole word Pot Pot was about celebrating the pots uh, in India. So whether it was pottery, whether it was portlies, whether it was potholes. So we took the idea of portlies. We kept three components. We measured sauces to the exact dimension. And we, all we said was gave instructions that just mix it together. So you take your palak patta, which remains crispy. You add your dahi, which remains cold. And then you add your toppings and chutneys on top of it. And it becomes a fresh palak patta chart at home. And very quickly, we started planning the delivery product before we planned the dining product. So we would first see, will this product survive in delivery? And if it survives in delivery, it would then go into dining. Because we realize a lot of people would go to restaurants, even if they go twice a week, the third time they might feel lazy and they might have exams or they might not want to go out and they might want to eat the same product at home. Or actually the other way around as well. They might have ordered this dish twice. Yes. And, and, they, and, and now then they, want they to go show and up at the it. restaurant. Absolutely. Delivery to dine-in is easily transferable, but the other way is not true. Eventually, 100% of your subset needs to be on delivery. I've I've realized that in a brand. So if you're doing it from a restaurant, eventually, if you plan to do delivery eventually, you need to plan both parallel. Uh, And I think because what a lot of people don't realize is that um, what they're not going to re-look at the menu. They're just going to remember that I went to this restaurant. I like this dish. I want the same dish. A lot of people don't realize this uh, and I've said this and you know some people get confused by this is that people don't go to a restaurant to eat something new every time they go to eat what they ate last time that's the that's the one of the biggest learnings that has been there with me for the last 14 years how much do you think this is 
I according to me, repeat orders would be about seventy percent at least. It's sixty percent on Zomato. Yeah, so it's there you go. User ordering the same dish. Same <laughs> dish. So <clears throat> when you go to a restaurant and you eat something, maybe the next time you go, you might discover a new dish because you might have gone in a larger group and you were, you know, maybe in a smaller group the first time. Or uh, you might take a bite from somebody else's plate, etc., and you'll discover a new dish. Your discovery is irrelevant to what you went there for. So if I went for a Thai curry, I want to eat that same Thai curry again and again and again. And a lot of people talk about brands that have been around for thirty years, and they talk about things that they must have eaten thirty years ago. Yeah. And I think generally what I've seen is that if people really like a dish, they would eat. They would have the dish about ten times over the next twelve months. Right. And then they would continue having it once a year, twice a year for the rest of the five years, and then it would be out of sight, out of mind. Right. And when we look at, and of course, Zomato helps in understanding item level stats. When we realize that a dish has been ordered a lot, when we develop a new dish, our target is to beat the highest selling dish. Our target is not to beat a dish that is lower selling. We had a dish. Which sold for about ten years, which was a chicken and basil dim sum. It was the most popular dim sum that we had, and we worked on a new dish, which was a chicken and chili oil dumpling, for many, many, many months, almost a couple of years, I guess. All with the target that that dish needs to go away. And my metric was not all this. I didn't know all this stat, and you know that people only order ten times or whatever. It was that I didn't personally like the dish. Right, so I said that I'm not liking it. Why is it the highest selling? I need to find something that I like that will beat that dish. And by doing that, we realized that when you, you know, you you can take something and you can kind of beat the the the, the older dish, and then the volume literally doubles of the category because the people ordering that dish are not really going away. Maybe only twenty percent of those go away and shift to the new dish, but then there's a whole new category, and when it becomes the most popular dish, that your entire base doubles. Of of the kind of stuff that you're that you're doing, so you know, I think uh, consistency, for example, and making sure that the dishes taste the same every time you go and taste the same in delivery as they do in dining, or relatively the same, is very very important. And and you said that uh, your business sort of tripled during COVID. Yes, that was delivery only. I'm guessing. No, uh, no. the business as a group tripled. As a group, delivery would have gone at least ten ten x. Ten x. And catering also grew during that so time. So during COVID, when catering came back, mm-hmm. it it came back bigger than 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 earlier desirable. Uh, people had the propensity to spend more, you know, to do larger events. Um, even during COVID, when they would do smaller events, they would have a larger budget because they say that rather than doing three events for someone, we would do only one event. And we also realized that we had a lot of trust in Delhi as a city. And COVID, as you know, a lot of it was trust. If you trust somebody, you would order their food. Otherwise, you may not. And slowly that changed, and people started ordering everything. But at least in the early days, it uh, it was it was completely trust related. And even if somebody was doing a party for only ten people versus doing a party for hundred people, they would call up uh, the person they would trust more. So if we were doing catering events we started getting the lion's share of the orders because people would trust us more and the frequency of those 10 people parties started going up so now i want to call all 100 people i can't ignore so now i have to have 10 parties to do the same thing but a 100 person party costs less 10 person party per head will cost more so suddenly you still get 100 people but over 10 parties and your revenue goes up So that's that's kind of what happened, and I think every business uh, went up. I think we some I read somewhere that never waste a crisis. You know, the crisis represents an opportunity, and that is something that we we did. I did also go through times of immense uh, doubt of whether something would do well or not. So, for example, we created a brand called VT. People were making sourdough online on YouTube. I still remember my wife. Picking up the phone and calling our GP at the time, our doctor, and saying that ah please कुछ करो मेरा husband मेरे husband को कुछ हो गया है वो सुबह सुबह पांच बजे उठके अपने साड़ों को feed कर रहा है और उसने साड़ों को नाम भी दे दिया 
तो आप कोई किसी को रेकमेंड करो कि वो कर क्या रहा है हमारा काम कम हो गया है और ये अपने साडो को खिला रहा है सुबह उठ के तो आप थोड़ा देखो कि हो क्या रहा है सो यू नो यू यूर लुक एट दो थिंग्स बट आई थिंक इट जस्ट अलाउड यू टू लुक गेट मोर पर्सनल टाइम टू अंडरस्टैंड वॉट वॉट यू लाइक मोर देन अदर्स to remove all the all the clouds or all the fuzz around you all the opinions there were no more opinions to be given and you would just operate in an isolated state to decide and i think a positive positive outlook that it will work right something will happen and uh, i don't know if i should share this here or not but uh, april may june 2020 i'm talking about the lockdown quarter we finished april may june during that quarter we had uh, like everybody Uh, there were salary cuts that took place so we had opened up the forum to our company and said that you take um whatever percentage hits that you want but you decide so they chose 40 30 20 and 10 for the lowest category i waved off the lowest category immediately i said at least don't touch the lowest category but we'll accept the the voluntary salary cuts april may june 2020 we figured at the end of it we had we were green we had turned a profit in that lockdown quarter and we paid back that salary in july august and september whatever salary was cut we took 3 months and we kind of paid it back and at that point i realized that a positive outlook i mean because it was very rare to see a food slash restaurant slash human led business uh kind of be profitable during a time that uh, business had pretty much stopped for most and uh, we attribute obviously our team had done a fantastic job we were able to help the community by doing a lot of meals so our kitchen never shut down that was a by product our kitchen was always on our fires never stopped um and uh, you know i i i think those opportunities that exist people who complain for example and say that this is not there or that is not there or the commissions are high or there is a way around it there is a there is a way to rectify and win regardless and right now how much of your business comes from dine in versus so in our total a uh, business we have 20% is catering we have about 25 to 26% delivery and about 54 55% dine in and where do you see this going let's say 10 years from now so i definitely see the restaurant and delivery business grow because there are only so many days in a year that you can do catering within restaurant delivery and dine in i pretty much see them grow together i do feel that delivery has actually induced more people to want to go out and dine in again because now people are eating seven times eight times a week at least i don't know what the national average is or what the statistical bureau has given like they talk about singapore having 14 or 15 or 16 meals a week out i think india has already gone to seven or eight meals outside it's more or less like four national that's what i'm saying so that that's the statistic correct but you maybe have to take a a a median rather than a rather than a statistical average mm-hmm. to see that in my market segment of people who do eat what yes. is the average in yours is definitely higher uh, right and maybe there is a segment of people who don't eat out at all so you need to remove those from the statistical you know and take someone who's at least ordering once a week and someone who might be ordering 14 times a week and to look at the median of that rather than 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 or to take a look at mm-hmm. the most china is like 60 times a month maybe more singapore is about 30ish don't know singapore is more than china i believe singapore would be uh, see a, a lot of times the, your uh, street vendors don't get counted as well so i would say that consumption is going to go up exponentially in india right uh the brands that are doing well from a everyday standpoint at a lower market segment become an aspirational brand for someone and the brands that have are aspirational for someone else may become everyday brands for others right you've seen this that restaurants where you couldn't even imagine uh expensive restaurants where people would actually order delivery from people did start ordering deli- you know delivery from actual restaurants expecting an actual restaurant experience at home Twenty thousand rupee, fifty thousand rupee orders. We've seen those kind of orders as well, and uh, I definitely see consumption overall growing. Right? 
Uh, I do think that uh, there will be a mix of both dine-in and delivery. I am very bullish on, to be honest with you, I'm very bullish on dine-in as well. I do feel that the food, no matter what, comes out better in dine-in. Uh, but delivery is something that is going to become a necessity rather than a luxury. So dine-in will grow in the luxury segment. I feel that people who want an ambiance, an experience, a celebration are going to... Sometimes people just need to get out of their homes. So yes, hmm. correct. And delivery will become a need. I have to eat, so I order. I, I don't see what is in the kitchen. I don't see, you know, we will see apartments being launched in mm -hmm. India without kitchens. And, and these two businesses complement each other really well. This yes. makes this grow and this makes this grow. So it's a flywheel sort yes. of thing. So we've seen products like Rajma Chawal do so well in delivery, you know. Uh, you have Rajma Chawal? We have Rajma Chawal, pot pot. One of the highest selling dishes. You know how to cook Rajma Chawal? Of course. And I know how to sell it for 700 rupees. <laughs> 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 so, so, of course. Sometimes a person wants to eat Rajma Chawal. Worth so 700 after. rupees. Yeah. <laughs> It comes in really nice packaging yeah. and it comes, uh, you get the experience, you get the ability, you get the Jammu se Rajma aare hai, to paise to lagte hai. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm talking about including tax and yeah. delivery yeah. charges, you but yes. To, you don't have to yes. defend it. Yeah. Yes, yes. But why should I complain if somebody wants to no, pay 700 no. rupees for Rajma? Absolutely. Rajma. I think uh, there is a lot of cost to adding love to the meals that you yes. prepare and I mean, that's yes. better than uh, factory made food. But my point is that a person who is used to eating Rajma Chawal on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon wants to eat Rajma Chawal on a Saturday or Sunday. Now, there's nobody at home to eat because the kids have grown up. Uh, Everybody is doing their own thing. People have started eating in the dining. The concept of the dining table has gone away. Uh, we've literally had situations in which we've seen three orders from the same house, from the same restaurant because the three people sitting in three different rooms probably ordering are from, talking from to our, each other uh, oh. uh, ordering they, they don't know that the other person is kind of ordering so now if i'm used to eating rajma chawal on a sunday afternoon i'm the only one eating what am i going to do i'm not going to get the rajmas you know a lot of people will forget the rajmas have to be soaked at night you know all that kind of you just press a button and the rajma chawal mm -hmm. comes home so i think people have started ordering what they like to eat not just food used to be very aspirational. Even Indian food, for example, used to be restricted to butter chicken, dal, naan. That used to be the environment of Indian food, right? Chinese used to be hakka noodles. Now people are ordering pili dal. Hakka, hakka, I haven't even heard of that like for a while now, right? So Yes, you have not heard. Indian Chinese, for example, has started fading uh, in terms of the, the popularity in favor of things like sushi, right? And... I'm sure you yourself are surprised with the popularity of sushi as a category. Uh, it is just everywhere. It's just everywhere. It is everywhere. I still remember a very, very prominent, I don't want to take his name, very prominent restaurateur had come in in 2009 to Yum Yum Tree. He was, he had gone for a movie. He wanted to go for a movie at, at, at 12.30 and he came in at about 11.45. We had opened at 12 o'clock and he sat with me and he said, Mujhe jaldi khila de khana. Uh, and uh, another guest walked in and they ordered sushi, right? And they started eating sushi. And he told me that Dekho, India me logon ko sushi khani nahi aati. Wo dekh, wo chili sauce dal ke sushi khara hai. So I told him, Kha to rahe. Khane do. Khane do. <laughs> to order to kar rahe, kha to rahe. And I think. In India, we like to make our own rules, right? I mean, we like to eat what we want to eat. We like to eat it how we want to eat it. And we may butcher the hell out of an international uh, product. But that's but us. That's and that's, that's how, right? and that's that's how, how like, eat. we would like that food. Like, and nobody can and nobody us can, it. And nobody can, nobody can stop it, right? Yeah. Nobody can stop the condiment culture in India, for example. <laughs> they love condiments. They love adding th stuff. You know, they love adding things to... You know, my dad adds salt to things without even tasting. You know, you, 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 you say, okay, taste it, take a bite. But you're like, I know, you know, don't teach me, don't tell me. So I have to add the chutney, I have to add the toppings or whatever it is. And we have to eat it that way. And we kind of know how to kind of do it. So uh, people are now ordering what they want to order. And uh, you may want to, you know, they're not looking at uh, what may looked at uh, be looked at as restaurant food versus house food. I think that has had a merger where food is food. Good food is good food. It could be the simplest dish. 
in the world, but people are ordering it, right? People may be ordering a chili cheese toast. I had a friend staying with me uh, from London um, and he was staying for a couple of uh, weeks with me. One day I saw him ordering omelette and toast. I said, boss, we have people at home. We can help you. you all you had to do is tell uh, our uh, cook at home to make an omelette and toast. He said, who will go? Who will talk about it? I was sitting on the laptop, on Zoom call. So I ordered it. Omelette or toast. Omelette or toast. Are you ready for surgery? Now, people are ordering those kind of things. It's it, very it's widely a, ordered during yes, breakfast. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So people are not cooking at home. And they... So it becomes need, right? I mean, I want to eat. I'm having breakfast. I want to eat, and I. And there are uh, restaurants which only serve omelet and toast from seven a.m. to eleven a.m. in the morning, and that's it. Great four hours, food. four hours, like just one thing. Specialized. Good, good omelet brand coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think the culture of India is definitely changing, and we are moving away from. just doing major meals outside of home to yes. doing our regular meals outside yes. from outside of home and we are a, i mean i i hate to say this on a public forum but we are a lazy country we like to we humans, like to humans are lazy, are lazy. it's not yeah. just lazy yeah, 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 country yeah. we like convenience right we, we like, like convenience we like to we like to be sitting on our sofa watching tv we are actually genetically wired to preserve the calories that we have in our bodies right so it's not like anything related to india this is sure. humans so but we are also used to we are also used to having help at home right and now imagine a young couple moving to a new city they move from delhi to bangalore and now they don't have the luxury of 24 hour help right they are used to someone bringing something to them so a zomato might be bringing it rather than uh, a 24 hour house help but the point is they are sitting at home tired from work and they are able to kind of have the product brought to them rather than go there you know so i think the nature uh, of india is to have people around you people around you doing things we aren't an isolated culture we are not a culture in which you know we like to sit with people and eat we like to you know share uh, your order sizes might be portion sizes order sizes might be more shareable uh, you know in in general and uh, i think that has a big role to play in the delivery culture i mean blinkit is a great example right i mean i would reckon our house has an average of three orders a day not not a week or not one order a day because literally the one order definitely comes as soon as the order comes in to the house the order comes immediately because you remember i forgot to order x y or z only when you see that blinkit bag you realize that acha ye kyun nahi order kiya to ye order kar do and then one time you order maybe you know at snack time or you know midnight near midnight i'm sure there are a lot of orders that kind of come in late night chocolate what do what do you order what do i order on yeah. blanket mainly vegetables fruits you I have know. spoken about eating vegetables many times but i've never seen you eat i'm vegetable. usually vegetarian now no no i know but not vegetables no vegetables vegetables yeah but i've seen you eating a vegetarian muffin i've seen you eating <laughs> <laughs> no 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 but my, but my lunch is usually grilled uh, grilled uh, veggies and some like chicken some prawn something on the side so you're trying to tell me that you yourself go on your app and order the vegetables for the house yes and whenever i want to cook myself or have the house help cook right but even my uh, zomato orders are the same but something, no snacks nothing unhealthy I mean, good days and bad days. Bad days, I would bad do it. Yeah, like, whenever I'm stressed or having a bad day, I would eat a samosa or have a muffin, like something like that. But right. on happy days, generally no. And what do you order on Zomato, for example? Same, like a grilled chicken breast, like grilled salmon salad, right? Same thing. I think uh, uh, wheat is the root cause of, of yeah. diabetes, gaining. Wheat and so on and so on. Wheat and sugar. Wheat and sugar are the same thing, according to me. At least for me, everybody is different. But it is. It is processed in the same way. Mm-hmm. And we are a carb country. We love carbs in 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 India. I think as a as a culture, we love carbs. And in fact, it's one of the unique cultures, and we've discovered it. And coming back to the Hakka noodle point, when we opened Yam Yam Cha, uh, the biggest advantage of not doing Hakka noodles is. we were forced to look at the starch as a main course 
which for a lot of people, starch is the main course, yeah. pasta is the main course, noodles and rice are a main course. So we did these sizzling stone bowls. Now, when you're paying five, six, seven hundred rupees for a noodle dish, it becomes your main course. It's it's no longer an accompaniment. So it went from being a accompaniment to a main course, and we realized very early that even a sandwich, for that matter, a grilled sandwich, uh, you know, a burger, these are main courses. They're not appetizers in 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 India. Absolutely. They enjoy biryani is the highest ordered. It's yes. about the rice. It's about the starch. Yeah. We have this feature coming up on uh, Zomato. Whenever you order a naan, when you add a naan to your order, we have something slide open under it. And we ask you, to, do you want to switch to a roti instead of a naan? Okay. So at least start shifting preferences to from white bread to brown bread. And gradually then like start educating and training people to do but themselves what if, less What harm. if you don't sell rotis? Like um, we in Port Port don't sell roti. Only don't those restaurants the, where those alternates are available will will be able to do this. But it could be health induced also, right? It could be stats induced that that this has more fiber or this has more. Then I mean, customers make their own choice, but this is generally not true. This, but it doesn't say pure, DP says wheat is bad. That pure pure meda versus brown. So, but you could even just supplement it with an image of you holding a balan. <laughs> <laughs> and saying so if you order carbs or a roti no, i think it's the like customer's choice and we have to we have to do our job to remind the customers that there is a choice conscious choice right uh, i mean a lot of times we just pair something with a naan right and even if we remind a customer that hey there is a roti as well do you want to switch it they um, might still they might still they, switch they might. and it is like you can actually do the naan if you want to this totally your choice we're not forcing a choice but have you seen starch uh, orders accompaniments based orders reduce i mean the component of accompaniments reduce not really not yet not really i mean there is a small section of customers maybe like 2.5 ish percent of our customers which have gone low carb not zero carb I man i think there is no such thing as zero carb right so uh, they have gone low carb but that's a very small segment of the customers but you don't that's, have allergies on your platform right now we don't right? have allergies on our platform so if somebody has wants to go low carb or if somebody wants to avoid a certain type of dairy or some other type of product i mean you have veg and non veg veg non veg egg i believe are the other three categories so you don't think there's a there's a need for that i mean if somebody wants to eat low carb for example they can just maybe only see the dishes that that are low carb we are doing this with restaurants so we have seen a complete opposite switch, uh, shift mm -hmm. we have actually seen people eat more white then whole wheat it's actually being polarized in a certain way so the people who are eating wheat are going more and more towards wheat and the people are addiction cycles right so either people who break out of it or you just like keep going down the downward uh, spiral but what about what about food that is high in oil or spice Spicy, uh, spicy. We have a filter now. Right. I mean, medium spicy, low spicy, high, right. high, high in spice. Right. So we'll gradually. I mean, everything needs us to collect data for about twenty-five million dishes. Right. So each feature is a three, four-month effort. Right. So and then we have to educate the users on it, and then we start with the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So none of your decisions are are they ever led to? I mean, are, are they are the decisions that you made which might reduce your overall business? Like for example. You're saying that I'm taking this decision for offering health, right? You put a warning sign in there. Don't order a roti. Can there be a situation where people stop ordering the accompaniment completely based on that or reduce the no total number of orders? We are okay with this. I mean, because uh, let's say, ideally, if you switch a naan to a roti, you the should cost be, is also the cost also mm -hmm. goes down. So this might hurt. Right. But uh, on the other hand, you might order two rotis mm -hmm. instead of one naan. So the cost might be the same. So these things we never know which way they will go. Right. But since it's the right thing to do, we are like, okay, let's just do it. But how many of your decisions on your platform are revenue led, or my 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 business will increase? Almost none. And uh, our team doesn't have goals. That's the good thing about how we work. Right. So we don't have targets for the team to achieve for the next quarter. Either it's revenue, profit, nothing. So it's we're generally asking people to do the most amount of good work that they can do and push as hard as they can.